Welcome to our module on sampling theory, where we are going to engage with some of the specifics of how digital audio hardware in particular works. And so let's get into that by contrasting this with the way that analog audio recording technologies, such as LPs or cassette tapes, or other kind of tape formats, wax cylinders work. All of these analog audio recording formats work by transferring the shape of a vibration in the air into an analogous shape in some physical medium. If we look over here on the right at this uh, close-up um, of, of a piece of vinyl, a vinyl record, we can see that there are these grooves in the record and what happens is um, oversimplifying a little bit the the needle of the record player um, goes through that groove and it's able to then transfer that shape of that groove back to the shape of um, at first vibrating electricity and then later to vibrating air again in any case with analog audio recording technologies the shape of the air vibration also exists in an analogous shape in some kind of physical medium. And the potential problem with this is that physical media, shapes in physical media, tend to change over time. Um, and as we know, these types of um, recording formats um, often are not as in great a shape five or 10 or 20 or 50 years later. And hence, one of the major attractions of digital audio recording technologies. So what we have here on the left is a close-up of zooming in to a waveform in the Reaper digital audio workstation. And if we look quite closely, we can see that the, the waveform is not um, just a smooth line. In fact, it's a series of these little dots, these very regularly spaced dots at different um, um, amplitudes, high or low. And so what we're seeing here um, by zooming in on this waveform is something f very fundamental about digital recording. In digital recording, the shape of the air vibration, instead of being transferred to another analogous shape in a physical medium, it becomes a series of measurements. We can think of each one of these dots, which each one of, each one of these dots, each of which represents a measurement, um, we can think of them as a number, you know, with lower numbers being down here and higher numbers being up here. And when we think of that shape as a series of measurements or a series of numbers, um, we can then represent those numbers in a very precise and lasting way using digital bits, which is something that we'll come back to um, in a few slides. So here's what a typical chain looks like when we use digital recording technologies. At, let's say, the beginning of the chain, we have some kind of sound source, could be someone talking, and the energy that they put into the air, the vibrations that they put into the air, travel through that distance as, a, as, a, as vibrating air, and let's say that they arrive at a microphone. And the microphone transduces all of that vibrating air into a vibrating voltage, a very tiny vibrating voltage. Could be a positive voltage, could be a negative voltage. And then it goes into a preamplifier and becomes a slightly larger vibrating voltage. And then in our digital recording chain, that slightly larger vibrating voltage is fed to um, a, a very key component, the, the ADAC or ADC, analog to digital converter, which takes that vibrating voltage and it regularly measures it, turns it into that series of numbers that is fundamental to digital recording. So we can also look at the digital playback chain, um, which is going to be very similar, but, um, but in reverse. So the digital playback chain might start with a long series of samples or measurements, and each of those measurements um, there's a key component called a DAC, or DAC, or Digital to Analog Converter, that takes those measurements and turns them back into a continuously varying, continuously vibrating 
electrical voltage. Um, that voltage is generally pretty small, so there's an amplifier that turns it into an, a larger voltage, and hopefully that larger voltage is big enough that it can make a loudspeaker cone or the driver in a headphone move. And whether it's a loudspeaker cone or a driver in a headphone, that motion then becomes vibrating air molecules again, and um, the, you know, the, those vibrating air molecules, that vibration in the air, um, eventually reaches some kind of listener in the playback situation. So that's kind of the overall picture of how digital audio recording and playback works. Um, and so now let's get to some of the detailed questions about this. And probably the first and most basic question is, we're going to measure these audio levels periodically. How fast, how often do we need to make those measurements? So let's consider two scenarios. Scenario number one. Imagine that um, this curvy line in the middle here is some signal that we want to record. It's a regular frequency. It looks like a sine wave. And it's, it has a, a certain frequency, which is defined by the distance from about here to here. That's how long it takes for that signal to repeat. That's its frequency. And let's say that we take measurements where I've marked the x's on the diagram. So the x's here are somewhat further apart. We're not sampling, we're not measuring the audio signal as frequently as this signal repeats. So in other words, we have a higher frequency signal than our lower frequency sampling rate. And in this situation, um, hopefully it's clear that our measurements aren't really going to reflect this shape very well at all. Like the shape we have is this nice curvy repeating shape, but all we're measuring is here and here, which is, you know, by coincidence happens to be right in the middle. So we're just going to get what looks like a, a straight line out of those measurements. Not very useful. What if we flip things around? So over here on the right, here again we have some frequency um, in a signal that we're trying to measure. And now we're making the measurements at all of these x's, and they're very close together. So we're actually measuring much faster. We're measuring at a much higher frequency than the frequency of the signal that we're hoping to capture. And that's, this is going to work much better, right? Because we're going to have a measurement here, and a measurement here, and a measurement here, and a measurement here, and a measurement here. It won't have exactly the same shape as our um, original signal, but clearly it'll be a much, much, much better representation of what we're trying to capture. So we've arrived here at a basic idea, um, a basic answer to this question of how fast we need to measure. Um, clearly we need to measure at a somewhat higher frequency than the highest frequency in what we are trying to record. So there's a theorem about this, um, which actually gives us an even more precise answer to what kind of sampling rate we need. It gives us an even more precise answer to um, how fast we have to measure our audio signals for this all to work. And that theorem is called the Nyquist theorem. Um, we've already seen that higher sampling rates are going to let us represent higher frequencies. And what the Nyquist theorem says is that the highest representable frequency is exactly half the sampling rate. For example, if we are taking measurements 10,000 times per second, 10,000 hertz, the highest frequency we'll be able to represent will be half of that, or 5,000 hertz. We can um, also call that frequency the Nyquist frequency. In other words, the Nyquist frequency is that frequency which is half the sampling rate, which is going to be the highest one that you can record um, without having um, um, certain problems. So some common sampling rates. 44,100 hertz, or 44.1 kilohertz, is the sampling rate that was set by the CD audio standard in the 1980s. And it's still with us, and it's still commonly found in audio files and in computer audio and in other settings. And if we, th we think about what we just said about the Nyquist theorem, the, the highest frequency we're going to be able to represent using this sampling rate is going to be half of that, and half of 44,100 is 22,050 hertz. 
And so if you um, think back to what we've said about the limits of human hearing in terms of frequency, um, we said that a common uh, figure for the upper limit, the, for the highest frequency we, we could potentially hear as human beings, was in the neighborhood of 20,000 hertz. And so the Nyquist frequency of the CD audio standard gives us a frequency that's a bit higher than that. So in theory, we should be able to represent all of the frequencies that human beings can hear using this sampling rate. Another common sampling rate is 48,000 hertz, just a little bit higher, 48 kilohertz. This is really common in video equipment. It has been for some time. And the Nyquist frequency of that, is, again, is going to be half of the sampling rate, and it's going to be 24,000 hertz, again, somewhat above the usual limit for human hearing. Um, we will also sometimes encounter uh, equipment and files that have been recorded at 96,000 hertz or 96 kilohertz. This is sometimes appropriate for fancy audio work, um, but it's not always advantageous. The Nyquist frequency, if we think about it, is going to be half of that. It's going to be 48,000 hertz. That is really very, very, very far above the upper limits of human hearing in terms of frequency. And so the question is going to arise, well, why would we actually want to do this? Uh, why would we want to record um, when what we're recording? Why would we want to use a format that records frequencies so far above what we can actually hear? And there's really two reasons. They're both kind of specialized why we might want this. Um, the first is that perhaps we actually do want to record things that are higher than what we can hear and later transform those higher, higher frequencies into things that are in the range of things that we can hear. So that's one reason to use a very high sampling rate. And another, um, perhaps more common reason, is that um, in building the hardware that does this digital audio sampling, um, there are some special considerations around filtering out things that are above the Nyquist frequency. And those filters that filter out things above the Nyquist frequency so we don't get weird recordings, those can be designed in different ways and perhaps in ways that are more flattering um, to the audio or more neutral um, when the Nyquist frequency is really, really, really far away from the limit of our hearing. That said, I think for a lot of normal work, um, we don't need um, to go to this length of using very, very high sampling rates. So we've talked about sampling rates, in other words, how often we're taking the measurements, and now we're going to flip to the other dimension and talk about how much detail each of our measurements has. And ultimately, each of our measurements is going to be recorded as a number in a computer or a media system, and in the, that computer or in that media system, that number is going to be represented with bits, which are um, simple yes or no values. There, a bit is something that can be either a yes or a no, an on or an off. And by combining lots of these bits, we can represent larger and larger spaces of possibility. For example, if all we have is a single bit, one yes or no, clearly there are two possibilities there yes or no. But if we have a yes or no and another yes or no, in other words two bits, there's four possible combinations of those things. We can have no no, no yes, yes no, and yes yes. And if we have three bits, like yes no and another yes no and another yes no, then there are eight possibilities. And every time we add an additional bit, every time we add an additional um, mark representing a yes or no, we're going to be doubling the number of possible combinations of all those things. Um, so this is kind of like the math of the combinatorial math of, of bits and digital numbers. So now let's, um, let's kind of keep that in the back of our minds and think about what's going to happen if we try to measure how high or low a signal is when we have a very low number of possibilities versus a very high number of possibilities. So over here on the left, um, we're showing the low number of possibilities scenario. And over here on the right, we're showing the high number of possibilities scenario. And the curvy line, again, is some signal that we want to record. And so let's say that at, right at this moment, we're, we're me measuring the signal. 
but let's say that we only have two possibilities, a zero here and a one here for measuring the signal. And then we know the signal is actually here at this point in time, and so there's gonna be a difference between the measurement we get, our only possible value, which will be right here, and the measurement we wish we could take, the true measurement, which will be right here. So there's this difference here that I've marked with the bracket and the star here. So the thing to realize about this difference is that it's basically random, right? Like our measurements are all going to be off by some difference that is, um, you know, less than half of the diff distance between our two possibilities. In this case, let's say the difference is this, this much. Now if we go over here to the right, let's say that we have lots more possible measurements we can make. Um, lots more possible values we can give to that measurement. Now, well here we're kind of sampling something that's at a pretty similar height to over here. There's still going to be a little bit of a random difference between the signal that we really want and the measurement we get, but it's going to be much, much, much smaller because we have less possibilities. So if we were to listen to that, to this signal, it would not sound like the original signal. It would sound like the original signal as well as some random difference that was added by the, the discrepancy between what our system of measurement was capable of representing and the original. And so since that difference is random, it would basically be a kind of noise. It would be a kind of a kind of hiss, right? A kind of digital noise, and as we'll see, it has another name in a second. So just as with sampling rate, we can kind of deal with it intuitively and then deal with the precise law that describes the describes what's going on. Similar thing with bit depth. Every additional bit that we add to our measurements uh, is going to make the, that random difference between the actual thing and what we record half as big. It's going to make that random noise half as big. It's going to make it twice as small. In other words, the digital noise, which also gets called quantization error, among other names, is going to go down by six decibels. And so we will be able to roughly estimate how big the digital noise in our system is by multiplying minus six decibels by the number of bits that we're using for each measurement. So here's some typical bit depths in our digital audio formats. Eight bits, still occasionally see it in greeting cards. If we take eight bits and we multiply it by minus six, we're gonna get uh, some digital noise at around minus 48 decibels full scale. Now, if you remember some of the things we said about the range of human hearing in terms of levels, we sort of expect that it's, this is going to be something, this is going to be kind of a kind of noise that is probably going to be easily audible at many playback volumes. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of those digital greeting cards sound so bad and sound so noisy. 16 bits is the bit depth that was used in the CD audio standard. And if we take 16 bits and we multiply it by minus 6 decibels, we get minus 96 decibels full scale. Now if you think about that number, basically what that's saying is that the digital noise, the quantization error, is going to be about 100 decibels below the maximum level that we can represent. And you know, 100 decibels is kind of on the borderline of um, being something that is perhaps going to be too quiet for us to hear in many playback situations. But if it gets a bit louder, like if we make that digital noise 20 decibels louder, by amplifying it, um, then map, maybe it is going to come into, into the range of something that we can hear and be irritated by. And this is really the reason why we might be interested in using 24 bits to record each of our measurements. Because when we use 24 bits, we multiply that by minus 6 decibels, that digital noise floor, that quantization error, is going to be down at around minus 144 call it minus 150 decibels full scale, that's really well beyond um, the range of human hearing in terms of level, and it's really gonna, we're really going to have to amplify our, that digital noise or increase it a lot for it to come into the range of something that is, uh, is a problem for us, that it's something that we notice audibly. So strong reasons there to prefer um, 24 bits in our recording.
And so, in fact, I think that there's a kind of sweet spot when we're using a sampling rate of 48 kilohertz and a bit depth of 24 bits, and it's why we've recommended that rate for a lot of our um, project and tutorial work in this course. If you think about it, we, we want a sampling rate whose Nyquist frequency is a bit above what we can hear. And we want a bit depth that's going to put that digital noise pretty far away from becoming audible. We also don't want to record too much data. Like, we don't want to have files that are much bigger than what is necessary to accomplish our goals. And so 48 kilohertz for a sampling rate and 24 bits for a bit depth tends to accomplish all three of these goals. But with good equipment, and if we can verify that it genuinely is going to make an audible difference to our work, we certainly could work at higher sampling rates and bit depths. We would just have to accept um, that one of the costs of that would be um, having bigger files that we have to carry around and maintain and copy and back up and all that kind of fun stuff. So a summary of this module, we looked at how digital recording works um, by contrast to analog recording. We looked at the effects of sampling rate and introduced the Nyquist theorem. We also looked at the effects of bit depth on digital noise and then um, talked about some typical sampling rates and bit depths including why 48 kilohertz and 24 bits is often a sweet spot for our work.